When they came to power 18 months ago, the Albanese government, and in particular Penny Wong, betrayed every Jewish person in Australia. Penny Wong announced that Australia would from now on use the term, quote, occupied Palestinian territories to describe the territories in the West Bank and Gaza. She also announced that the federal government would no longer recognize West Jerusalem as Israel's capital. And equally appallingly, Penny Wong doubled the amount of Australian tax dollars your money sent to the much maligned United Nations Relief and Works Agency, which is the awkward sounding UNRWA for Palestinian refugees. $20 million of your money, which she has increased even further in the last few weeks as aid to the Palestinians. Well, it seems I was right to be appalled. This week we learned that Germany and other European countries are looking to freeze any further funding going to UNRWA. Two reports published following the October 7th barbaric rapes, murders, massacres by Hamas, wait for this, determined that over 100 Hamas terrorists who took part in those bloody murders and rapes are graduates of UNRWA schools. And at least 14 teachers and staff members of UNRWA schools, this is United Nations Relief Works Agency schools, celebrated the massacre on social media, including one post describing that day of brutality, carnage, cruelty, rape and murder and torture as an unforgettable, glorious morning. That's where your tax dollars are going, thanks to Penny Wong and the Albanese Labour government, to UNRWA. Now, I'll get on to that unforgettable, glorious morning in a moment. But first, here's a brief history discussion, courtesy of the brilliant, although controversial, British journalist and writer for The Times newspaper, Melanie Phillips, who I was honoured to share a stage with here in Sydney a few years ago. Unlike the ill-informed Penny Wong, Melanie Phillips is actually extremely well-versed in the history of Israel and the land known to some as Palestine. This week, she wrote a superb piece entitled Why Israel is Entitled in Law to the West Bank. As Melanie writes, there has never been any such thing in law as Palestinian land. There never was a state of Palestine. When the Romans conquered the Jewish kingdom of Judea, destroyed the Jewish temple, and drove the Jews of Judea into exile, the Romans renamed it Palestina in an attempt to erase its Jewish identity. When the last colonial occupier of the land, the Ottoman Empire, fell after the First World War, the international community that carved up the Middle East to create a number of new states and countries kept the name Palestine to describe the territory which was now to be recreated as the homeland of the Jewish people. You can see on the map there, on the screen, Jewish Palestine and Arab Palestine. Melanie then goes on further. This was cemented at the 1920 San Remo Conference and given the force of international treaty law by the League of Nations in the 1922 Mandate for Palestine. Britain then sliced some 70% off this land to create Transjordan, or what is now known as Jordan. And Palestine consisted of what is now Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. Melanie says, to make this quite clear, only the Jews were given the legal right to settle the land in what is now Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. That right has never been abrogated. The 1922 League of Nations mandate was ratified by the United Nations Charter of 1945, which pledged to uphold the agreements entered into by its predecessor, the League of Nations. 
the legally binding principles entitling the, entitling the Jewish people to settle all this land were subsequently further codified in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties of 1969, which confirmed that it included Judea and Samaria, i.e. the West Bank, and Gaza. Between 1922 and 1948, writes Melanie, quote, when people referred to the Palestinians, they were referring to the Jews. One reason why the term, quote, occupied Palestinian territories, unquote, is a nonsense, take note, Penny Wong, is that, as Melanie writes, quote, the areas in question were never Palestinian land, but were always legally designated for Jews alone to be entitled to settle, end of quote. When the UN finally declared the land of Israel, the Arab armies immediately attacked. We know this. This was the Israel-Arab War of 1948, where the Israelis were forced to defend themselves from annihilation. This 1982 documentary spells out what happened next. One of the enormous anomalies and discrepancies that arises in the partition of the Palestinian mandate into a Jewish state of Israel and an Arab state, which in this case was ruled by Jordan, is the fact that there were refugee problems on both sides. On the one hand, the Jewish communities of Lebanon, of Syria, of Iraq, of Tunis, of Libya, of Morocco were expelled, and 700,000 Jewish refugees came to Israel between 1948 and 1950. One of the success stories of our time is the ability of the small Israeli population of 800,000 to absorb this massive wave of refugees and integrate them as citizens of Israel. The Palestinian uh, refugee problem remained the way it is for more than three generations because the Arab countries wished it to be that way. None of them was willing to accept the fact of Israel. So they kept alive a fiction that Israel would be eliminated and therefore the refugees should sit where they were until the day would come when they would be able to overthrow Israel and retrieve their nation. Now since 67, at least, it has been clear to all the Arab countries that that was not going to happen. Melanie Phillips then goes on at length about various legal opinions written about all this and the wars that followed before concluding. And I urge you to read her article on, on Substack before concluding that Israel is not in, quote, illegal occupation of the Palestinian territory. She says that phrase, illegal occupation of the Palestinian territories, is legally illiterate. Yes, Penny Wong, legally illiterate. The Jews are the only people entitled in law to those territories. Melanie concludes, get over it, she says. Now, the fact that we are financing UNRWA is a vile obscenity. As I said, two reports show over 100 of the murderers and rapists of Hamas were educated by UNRWA, with 14 of UNRWA's current staff and teachers celebrating the unforgettable glorious morning of Sat Saturday, October 7th. The morning, and please, if you're squeamish, I apologise in advance for the graphic description. This unforgettable glorious morning led to this. We saw women who were shot in the eyes, in the face, um, many times in sensitive places, just to mutilate them. Our, our team were the ones to open the female body bags. It was I, indescribable. There was blood everywhere. Their underwear was often very bloody. The back of the heads were, were crushed and brains were coming out. One time we were warned, uh, this woman has no legs. Her legs were cut off. The faces had grimaces. Their, their, their mouths were, were contorted in pain. These women still had blood dripping from their ears, blood dripping from other places. And suddenly there was a flash of color. And what was it? It was these beautiful, beautiful manicures on these young girls. And we, we were taken aback, and that touched us so deeply because we're all women, and we know that a manicure is a sign of such hope. We gave them 
the honor that they did not get when, when they were murdered. We knew that we were probably going to be the last people to see these women, and it was very important to us to honor them and to love them, and we did. And here are just some of those Jewish women and girls murdered on October the 7th. There were many, many more. Anwar educates people who grow up to become murderers and rapists, and it is staffed by, by people, teachers and others, who celebrated that barbarity and savagery. And Penny Wong and Labor send our tax dollars to Anwar. Anwar is run by the United Nations. And here is the Deputy Executive Director of the United Nations Women, an organization called UN Women, repeatedly refusing to condemn Hamas. It's not just condemning sexual violence against women and in any war in general. It's specifically what occurred on October 7th, perpetrated by Hamas. Indeed, UN Women always supports impartial, independent investigations into any serious allegations of gender-based or sexual violence. And within the UN family, these investigations are led by the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights. And just to provide a little bit of context in terms of UN Women's role, UN Women specifically provides and has extensive knowledge on gender-based violence and provides and supports investigations as we do with all UN investigations. And so consequently, in this context and within the UN system, it is the Independent International Commission of Inquiry, which for us has the mandate to investigate all alleged violations. And on and on, in this context, the UN system. But yes, last night, UN women did finally condemn Hamas. It's only taken them eight weeks. Don't the left just make you want to vomit? 